Campaigners lost their latest battle today to make it legal for doctors to help severely disabled patients die. The assisted dying case was brought to the Supreme Court by the widow of locked-in syndrome sufferer Tony Nicholson and Paul Lamb, who was paralysed in a road accident. Judges ruled against them by a 7-2 to two majority. Well, let's discuss this with the Conservative MP Sir Richard Ottaway, who supports assisted dying, and Dr Andrew Ferguson of Care Not Killing, who, um, from the sound of the organisation, clearly do not. Um, gentlemen, thanks for being with us this evening. Um, if we can start, um, first of all, with uh, Sir Richard. Is this a disappointment, a real setback, or do you think, in some of the remarks that the judges made, uh, a step down the road towards a decision in your favour? Well, I think you put your finger on it. Obviously, I'm disappointed, but uh, in truth, not surprised by the judgment. But there was a lot in the judgment uh, that is pause for reflection. Um, they made it quite clear that Parliament ought to revisit this and indeed have issued a veiled threat that if they don't, they may go ahead and issue a certificate of uh, compatibility with the Human Rights Act. And um, also, it, it suggests that the DPP revisits his guidelines on assisted suicide. So uh, as far as my side of the argument is concerned, I think we've made real progress today. Dr Ferguson. Um, what did you take from the judgment and what the uh, Supreme Court had to say today? Well, the good news for us is that the law stays exactly as it currently is, and that means that protection is maintained for the very large numbers of vulnerable people who are going to be put under pressure if the law ever does eventually change, the elderly, what? people with disabilities, and, uh, and so on. So we agree with what Sir Richard's uh, just analysed, that yes, uh, the ball is firmly back in Parliament's court, but we welcome the decision so far that the law stays as it is. Just the remind Supreme us Court why no other. Why do you fear so much? Why do you believe that inappropriate pressure might be applied to patients in the final stages of their life? When we change law, three things happen. We do what the new law says. That's obvious. That's why we changed it. There's uh, a lot of evidence on this subject from other countries, the few countries where it's legalised, that we go further than the new law says. But the third and most important thing we do is to change the whole climate of public opinion, the whole way in which we have these discussions. And as soon as we enter into the health professionals' uh, therapeutic armamentarium, the possibility of assisting the suicide of people. I know from 14 years at the front line of the NHS that many people who feel a burden emotionally, financially, a care burden perhaps on the state or on their family, I, they're going to be vulnerable to subtle internal coercions which we can never screen against. Well, okay, we owe it, we me... owe it to them to protect their lives equally with everybody else. Let me pick up with Sir Richard. You mentioned public opinion. I'm not sure if it, Richard, it, Sir Richard, it was your organisation or others, but others certainly on your side of the fence cite a YouGov survey, which is quite telling, isn't it? 75% of people think something along these lines should become law. And if you look at the demographics, that's consistent across all parties and across all age groups. 13% disagree and 13 don't know. Yep. Uh, that would suggest public opinion is very much in favour of some kind of legislation along these lines. Well, as a practising politician, I'm hard pushed to think of any other policy that's got that level of support. And as you rightly say, it goes right across the board, even right across which newspaper you read and which part of the country you live in. But can I just pick up on what Andrew just said about protecting the vulnerable? I mean, uh, I agree with him. We should protect the vulnerable. That is why the legislation that I'm supporting, which is going up to the House of Lords in a couple of weeks' time, actually has serious safeguards in it, that you've got to be of south mi sound mind, certified by two doctors, you've got to be terminally ill uh, by an agreed uh, definition. Uh, there is a cooling off period. So there's no suggestion that the vulnerable are under pressure here. What we're doing is, as you just said, is that a large number of people want to have a say, uh, if they're terminally ill and of sound mind, how their lives come to an end. And that is the approach that I'm supporting. I wondered, um, Andrew Ferguson, what's the difference, do you think, between um, trying to avoid this idea of assisted suicide, to prevent that becoming legal, and physician-assisted death? which, as we all know, happens every day up and down this country to many, many people. 
Well, I, I challenge the fact that it happens every day. What happens every well, day is that, is that we sure, stop look, we're we all stop of a, We're all of an age, aren't we, where I'm sure we have nursed either our parents or somebody in a position who have nursed parents or elderly people to their deaths. And no. it is quite common nowadays no. that without no. actually explicitly saying so, there are protocols there which physicians follow which leads to a as comfortable yeah. as practicable death. What is the difference that... between that being either Martin, ignored... Martin, if I, if I could get a word in edgeways, I don't think there's any evidence at all that doctors are breaking the law. What is being done is that... Uh, treatments where the burden outweighs any possible benefit are being stopped, that there is uh, treatment of symptoms which may, but doesn't usually, it may possibly shorten life somewhat, but that's not its intention. If there was mass medical homicide going on, we would know about it, and we really don't. And I resent your suggestion that it's happening from my profession across the country. Life has a natural end. We're all going to die one day. We want a good death for ourselves and for our loved ones. But... Uh, Med medicine as a profession, by a very clear majority, is opposed to letting this legislation in. If Lord Faulkner's bill were to get through uh, uh, following the debate in three weeks' time, that would only be the beginning. There'd be a challenge on equality legislation. It wouldn't have covered Tony Nicholson and Paul Lamb anyway, and that's a sign of how many threads there are in a very complex debate. As soon as we accept the principle that doctors sometimes kill their patients, we are in big trouble. Sir Richard Ottawa, when we look at the ruling and the section where they seem to suggest that the overarching ban on assisted suicide was incompatible, or did rather breach, I think was the word they used, human rights, yeah. why do you think the Supreme Court didn't go further and extrapolate from that point, if they're legally happy with that point, to well, actually I... lift this ban or change the law? Yes, I, um, I think they made it pretty clear that whilst they thought uh, there were grounds for saying there was incompatibility, they still wanted to give Parliament a chance to have a say in this. And I think the reasons for this are quite clear. You, in, in a way, you've got to go have a look at the United States, where abortion is very controversial, mainly because it's a judicial system uh, uh, decision and not a decision of Congress. And here, if we have a judge, uh, 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 relaxation or change of the law brought about by the Supreme Court rather than Parliament, it will always be controversial. There will always be rows. Andrew and I will still be disagreeing with each other. But if it goes through Parliament, it gives it a legitimacy that it, it desperately needs. And uh, that, I think, is what the law lords were alluding to, that it really now is down to Parliament to make a decision on this. Otherwise, they will. Um, what are you thinking, um, Andrew Ferguson, from, I think, 18th of July is the second reading of yeah. Lord Faulkner's bill. Uh, that could go well against you then, by then, couldn't it? It remains to be seen. Um, traditionally, I understand that second readings are, are uh, allowed, that there won't be a vote against it. Uh, I'm fairly confident that it's going to be such a controversial and sensitive debate that some vote of some kind will be brought. Even if this were to go through in the Lords to become law of the land, it would have to go in the same form through the House of Commons. Um, Parliament has been said to hold the conscience of the nation, um, and that means it has to... Uh, take account of centuries, uh, millennia even, of moral debate about the principles behind this. It needs evidence about what's going on within medicine in the very few jurisdictions in the world which allow this. I certainly don't personally think that a three-hour debate on the floor of the Lords uh, in three weeks' time can possibly do justice, and I do wonder if we're getting to the point. Uh, it's almost ten years since we last had a select committee review the evidence. The principles won't have changed, but I do wonder if a review of the last ten years of evidence will uh, knock this subject on the head once and for all and in our favour. Well, I hope we can, uh, we'll can. we discuss it again and, um, and uh, look again at some of the issues surrounding it all. Dr Ferguson and Sir Andrew Ottaway, thank you, Sir Richard Ottaway, thank you very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you.